It's midnight. Welcome to Nightline. I'm Brendan Wong. The top stories. WHO advises Malaysia to prepare for wider transmission of COVID-19. And Malaysia's 2019 annual GDP growth at 4.3%. Good morning. The World Health Organization, WHO, has warned Malaysia that it is time to prepare for the possibility of wider transmission of the COVID-19, with schools needing to be closed and mass gatherings postponed. The UN agency cautioned that the region was at a critical juncture with a virus-confirmed presence in many parts of the world. According to WHO's Regional Director for the Western Pacific, Dr. Takashi Kasai, it was time for all countries, including Malaysia, to prepare in case there is a wider spread of the virus, as the latest information showed that the virus may be more transmittable than early data suggested due to new reports of clusters of cases with no apparent link to China. He added, while this does not mean that the virus will start spreading easily within Malaysia or elsewhere, the necessary preparation requires immediate action as it takes time for the response to reach everyone in all parts of the country. This includes ensuring health authorities can focus on treating the most vulnerable and severe cases instead of medically isolating everyone who is infected so that healthcare facilities do not become overwhelmed. This is also to ensure health facilities do not become places that amplify the virus spread, infecting staff and other patients. The authorities also need to be ready to consider closing schools or postponing mass gatherings if necessary to reduce opportunities for the virus to spread. <laughs> Meanwhile, responding to the matter, Health Minister Datuk Sri Dr Zulkifli Ahmad said that so far all episodes of cluster infection had been handled well by the Ministry and the National Disaster Management Agency, NADMA. He stressed the WHO statement that COVID-19 might spread further should be viewed in the appropriate context because Malaysia had not yet reached that stage. Kita belum sampai lagi to that stage. We have not really reached this stage yang disebutkan itu sebab dia pun menyebutkan kalau ya kalau kita sudah sampai ke situ keduanya uh, kalaupun sampai tahap itu kita bersedia untuk menangani cabaran itu if we have come to that stage we believe we are ready to take on that stage the minister also said as for now, the number of cases for COVID-19 in the country still stands at 18 and there were no new cases after tests were run on 550 close contacts. Malaysia's gross domestic product GDP expanded by 4.3% last year, compared with 4.7% growth registered in 2018. For the fourth quarter 2019, the country's economy slowed down to 3.6% from 4.7% recorded in the same period a year ago, the lowest since the third quarter of 2009. Growth in the fourth quarter was driven by higher private sector spending, both by households and businesses. Private sector spending grew by 7.4% in the fourth quarter compared to 5.4% in the third quarter of 2019. For the period under review, private consumption grew strongly by 8.1%, while private investment registered a higher growth of 4.2%. Core inflation, excluding the impact of consumption tax policy changes, stood at 1.4%. Dr. Nur Shamsia added, going into 2020, growth, particularly in the first quarter of the year, will be affected by the COVID-19 outbreak. The overall impact of the virus on the country's economy will, however, depend on the duration and spread of the outbreak as well as policy responses by authorities. Meanwhile, Bank Negara said there is ample room to adjust the overnight policy rate, OPR, to face any challenges in the economy. We have ample room. Um, inflation is still low. Like I said, monetary policy is determined collectively by the monetary policy committee. So I shouldn't preempt the monetary policy committee. But... Uh, our inflation is still low, and so we do have that policy, uh, that policy space. 
all information. Last month, BNM decided to trim the OPR by 25 basis points to 2.75%, the lowest in nine years. It was last cut to 3% from 3.25% in May last year. The MPC meets six times in a year, and the next meeting is scheduled to take place on March the 3rd, 2020. In the meantime, RAM Ratings said that the length and severity of COVID-19 will determine its impact on Malaysia's economic growth this year. It is understood that the rating agency has maintained its forecast this year at a cautiously optimistic 4.5% despite notable downside risks. It added the rapid spread of COVID-19 and its impact on discretionary services and industries such as tourism, retail and F&B may dampen the services sector, which is the largest sectoral component of the GDP. Ram said the fallout from the virus could shave 0.2 to 0.5 percentage points of its GDP growth projection for 2020. That said, the potential support from monetary and fiscal policies will play an integral role in sustaining growth momentum. Expedient rollout of projects as well as accommodative credit conditions are critical to driving growth this year amid such highly uncertain conditions. Former Education Minister Datuk Sri Matsir Khalid admitted that he did not tell the Prime Minister, Cabinet nor Parliament about his reluctance to award the solar hybrid project to Jepak Holdings Sendiri and Burhad. Datuk Sri Matsir, however, said as it was a project under the purview of the Education Ministry, it did not require reporting to neither the Cabinet nor the Dewan Rakyat. He was responding to questions by defence lawyer Dr. Jagjit Singh during his cross-examination in Datin Sri Roslaman's solar graph trial, which enters its fifth day before Judge Mohammad Zaini Maslan. Reading his witness statement, Dr. Sri Matzir said he was sure that Japa would not be able to execute the solar hybrid project on January the 1st, 2017, over its lack of expertise. He added that as of April 2018, Japa had still not installed the solar hybrid system as promised. Datu Jagjit asked the witness why he kept quiet about his concerns and did not inform a higher authority, to which Matsir replied that there was no need. The witness also told the court that during the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission's investigations into the solar project, the authorities did not seek a remand order against him. Court Defence Counsel Datu Akbadin Abdul Qadir then asked if Datu Sri Matsir was investigated for allegedly receiving a 50,000 ringgit bribe, a point that had previously been raised by Jagjit and was denied by the witness. Over the past several days, Datu Sri Matsir testified that he was pressured into issuing the letter of award to Japak from various parties, including Rosma, her aide Datu Rizal Mansur, as well as her husband and former Premier Datu Sri Najib Razak, who had issued various memos to the Education Ministry demanding the execution of the project between December 2015 and October 2016. Police will record statements from former Prime Minister Datu Sri Mohammad Najib Tun Razak and his wife Datin Sri Rosma Mansur next week to assist in investigations into several audio recordings released by the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission. Bukit Aman CID Deputy Director Datuk Mohammad Rozi Shari said they were trying to get a suitable date to enable both to be at the Federal Police Headquarters to give their statements. And on Monday, Mohammad Rozi had reportedly said that police had recorded statements from 12 witnesses to facilitate the investigations into nine audio recordings exposed by the MACC and allegedly involved a high-level criminal conspiracy. Those who had already had their statements taken include Baling Member of Parliament Dat Sri Abdul Aziz Abdul Rahim, Tan Sri Shukri Muhammad Saleh, who was Dat Sri Dajib's principal private secretary, and Datu Amhari Effendi Dasarudin, the former special officer to Datu Sri Najib. On January the 8th, the MACC released the audio recordings of a conversation allegedly involving leakage of information from the Attorney General's chambers to Datu Sri Najib when he was the Prime Minister, and the recordings of several other phone conversations with regard to investigations into 1MDB and SRC international scandals. Besides Datuk Sri Najib, the conversations allegedly involved Datin Sri Rosma, former MACC Chief Commissioner Tan Sri Zulkifli Ahmad, a member of the Abu Dhabi royalty and several other individuals.
Sarawak now has full control and authority over the supply, sales and distribution of natural gas within the state following an agreement signed between state-owned petroleum Sarawak Burhat, Petros and Petronas on Wednesday. Deputy Chief Minister Datu Awang Tenga Ali Hassan is hopeful that the state would now be able to attract more investors, adding that in the past, Sarawak had missed many investment opportunities due to insufficient gas supply. He said as a result, the government was previously left with no choice but to beg from Petronas and even wrote to the Prime Minister for more gas supply. With this, Sarawak is now in a strong position to enhance the attractiveness of the state as a frequent investment destination and to leapfrog our economic development to a high income economy by the year 2030. Datu Awang Tenga, who represented Chief Minister Datu Patinggi Abang Johari Openg at the ceremony said natural gas is the crown jewel of the state's petroleum resources, where it holds 54% of the total natural gas reserves and 29% of the total national oil reserves. He said from 2013 to 2018, Sarawak had been among the top three most preferred investment destinations in Malaysia, largely because the state was able to provide competitive power from its hydropower resources. However, many investors Investors had decided not to invest in the state due to the uncertainties of who was authorized to make decisions on gas supply, Petronas or the Sarawak government. He added with this arrangement, Sarawak can now leverage on its gas resources to accelerate economic development through more high-value downstream petrochemical activities. <laughs> After this break, four charged with using criminal force against Said Sadiq. Don't go away. Welcome back. Four men pleaded not guilty at the Johobaru Magistrates Court to a charge of assault or using criminal force against youth and sports minister Said Sadiq Said Abdul Rahman. They came to trial after the charge was read out to them in front of Magistrate Mohammad Zaki Abdul Rahman. The four individuals, Nur Hanizam Ithnain, Muhammad Iskandar Mas Indra Rasidi, Muhammad Iskandar Afik Abdul Razak and Izul Amran Abdul Rahim, allegedly committed the offence with the intention to dishonour the minister at a Bersatu Armada event held at Savannah Hill Resort in Ulutiram on January the 31st. They were charged under the penal code, which provides for up to two years jail or a fine or both if convicted. The court set bail at 7,000 ringgit with one surety each and ordered all the accused to report to the Sri Alam Police Headquarters every month. Mohamed Zaki also set March 15th for mention of the case. It was reported that in the incident, Said Sadiq, who is also Bersatu Armada chief, was forced to flee by climbing over a fence after a group of some 200 people gate-crashed the event before hackling and making threatening gestures to chase out the minister. Police have arrested an Indonesian man for allegedly slashing his friend, a plantation worker, to death and injuring the victim's wife in Dungan Trunganu on Wednesday. The 2.45 a.m. incident occurred after the couple had dinner with the suspect who was living alone at a Kongsi house at an oil plant plantation in Kampung Beril. District Police Chief Superintendent Baharuddin Abdullah said the 29-year-old suspect was nabbed after authorities found him hiding close to the scene of the crime at around 9 a.m. Uh, Satu kaki sembilan inci termasuk hulu sekali dan uh, motif sebenar kejadian ini uh, masih dalam siasatan dan kes uh, disiasat uh, di bawah seksyen uh, 302 kanun kesiasaan iaitu kesalahan membunuh. It was understood that both the victims, 39-year-old Muhammad Zukanain Abdulaziz, his wife Rosna Muhammad, aged 34, and their five children, had visited the suspect at 8 p.m. on Tuesday. 
After having dinner, the suspect who befriended Muhammad Zulkarnain four years ago suddenly approached the victim holding a machete. Seeing his friend acting weird, Muhammad Zulkarnain went to his car to get his parang before grabbing the weapon from the suspect. At the same time, the suspect seized the machete from Muhammad Zulkarnain's hand and used it to slash him on his neck before slashing his wife and fleeing the scene. Despite the injury, Muhammad Zulkarnain managed to drive to a guard post at a nearby ECRL construction project site to seek help. The couple was then taken to the Paka Health Clinic, but Muhammad Zulkarnain died on the way. His body was sent to Dungun Hospital for post-mortem. The driver of a Purudua Maivi in a viral video that caused a two-year-old boy to be thrown out of a car has been detained. Negri Sambilan Traffic Investigation and Enforcement Deputy Head DSP Shaiful Izan Sulaiman said the 20-year-old man was later remanded for three days to facilitate investigation. The man was arrested in Batu Burinda, Malacca. On Tuesday, the 59-second video recording of the incident via a dashboard camera went viral on social media. The incident took place at about 3.20 p.m. at kilometer 235.5 of the northbound Plus Expressway near Sanawang. The boy was traveling with his family in a car when he was thrown out of the vehicle after the driver lost control of the wheel while trying to avoid colliding with another car that was being driven in a dangerous manner. The boy was, however, extremely lucky to escape with only minor injuries. In Selango, an Indonesian man believed to be a member of a gang involved in bank robberies was injured after he was shot by police while attempting to evade arrest on Tuesday night. Sungai Bulo Police Chief Superintendent Shafa Aton Abu Bakar said the incident unfolded when authorities approached the suspect and ordered him to stop his motorcycle during a raid in Batu Lima Gombak at 9.30 p.m. The suspect, however, turned aggressive and hit the motorcycle of a policeman, prompting the police to fire two shots on the suspect before apprehending the foreigner. It was believed that the suspect and five others who had already been arrested were part of a robbery gang that targeted banks in Sungai Bulo. The case is being investigated under the Penal Code as well as Corrosive and Explosive Substances and Offensive Weapons Act. In Pera, the State Customs Department has foiled an attempt to smuggle cash in baht and ringgit denominations, totaling half a million ringgit into the country, following the arrest of three women, a local and two Thai nationals, during an operation on Friday. State Customs Director Dr. Mohamed Sapun said on February the 7th, a Honda Accord was stopped by enforcement officers at the Bukit Barampit Immigration Customs Quarantine and Security ICQS complex in Pengkalan Bulu. Checks on the vehicle revealed about 500,000 ringgit cash hidden inside three backpacks placed on the front passenger seat and in the boot of the car. The three women aged between 40 and 51 were then detained while the vehicle and bags were seized. The trio, who claimed they were business partners, were later remanded for four days to facilitate investigations. Authorities are looking into whether the women had links to any currency smuggling syndicate. China reports lowest number of new coronavirus cases. More on this when we return. The death toll from China's COVID-19 epidemic continued to climb on Wednesday as it now stands at 1,113 with the number of confirmed cases nationwide totaling 44,653 on Wednesday. However, there is some semblance of optimism as the number of new cases fell for a second straight day. According to the National Health Commission, the figure include 97 new deaths and 1,638 new cases in the hard-hit Hubei province. Across the nation, about 2,105 new cases were confirmed Tuesday, the lowest since January the 30th. The development offered some hope, not least for China's ruling Communist Party, which is trying to manage an outpouring of public anger over its handling of the emergency. In the meantime, Liberty Media Corp's Formula One, on the other hand, is postponing the Chinese Grand Prix, which is scheduled on April the 19th. Officials have yet to confirm whether the Grand Prix would be postponed or cancelled entirely. 
Over in Japan, another 39 people tested positive for the coronavirus on the quarantined Diamond Princess cruise ship, including one quarantine officer, bringing the total to 175 on Wednesday. The health ministry said the quarantine officer who was infected had been handing out questionnaires checking the health of passengers and crew since February the 3rd and had been following rules that require the wearing of a mask and gloves, but not a full protective suit. The Japanese government was also considering allowing elderly and those with chronic illnesses to disembark before the February 19th target date for the end of quarantine, but added it would take time to determine where they could be sent. <laughs> Over in Singapore, the city-state's biggest bank, DBS Group Holdings, has evacuated 300 staff from its head office on Wednesday as a precautionary measure following a confirmed coronavirus case at the bank. The company said in a statement that it had ordered its staff members on Level 43 at Marina Bay Financial Center, Tower 3, to work from home for the time being. The bank also said it was conducting detailed contact tracing related to the infected employee. Nakani secures victory in Stage 6 of La Tour de Langkawi. Stay tuned. Cycling the 2020 La Tour de Langkawi. Japanese Hideto Nakani of Nipo Delco province won the sixth stage of the race from Taiping to Pulau Pinang in dramatic fashion as he pipped Glenn Brzezinski of Vino Astana Motors in a two-man sprint towards the finish line on Wednesday. The Japanese and Kazakhstan rider Gleb Bruskensky of Vino Astana Motors crossed the finish line at the same time. But the Japanese was declared the winner of the 150.9 km race based on the photo finish. The chief judge then stated that both Nakani and Bruskensky clocked the same time of 3 hours, 29 minutes and 15 seconds. Coming in third was NTT Pro Cycling's Italian rider Samuel Battistella, who finished ahead of the chasing pack. Yellow jersey holder Daniela Celino of Team Sapura Cycling, meanwhile, failed to finish in the top 10, though he remained in the lead in the general classification standings with a 26-second advantage over Vino's Evgeny Fedorov, who still holds the white jersey as the best Asian rider. The seventh stage will commence on Thursday from Bagan to Alosta, covering 130.4 kilometers. Before we wrap up this edition of Nightline, let's take a look at what has been installed on the front pages of Malaysia's main newspapers on Thursday, February the 13th. The New Straits Times highlights the warning by the World Health Organization for Malaysia to be prepared for wider COVID-19 transmission. While Malaysia's best-selling Malay daily, Harian Metro, reports on an after-dinner murder case in Dungun Trenganu. Berita Harian highlights the latest development of COVID-19 in the country as Malaysia goes another day without new cases. And a report on Malaysia's 2019 GDP growth gets the front page of the Malaysian Reserve. 